Uh, can I welcome members to the seventh meeting in 2018 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee? Uh, can I welcome Michael Russell, Minister for UK Negotiations on Scotland Place in Europe, and his officials to the meeting to give evidence on the UK withdrawal from the European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill? Um, before that evidence session uh, begins, there's one piece of business the committee must decide first. Uh, and that is the decision on taking business in private. Um, it's proposed the committee takes items six and seven in private. Item six is consideration of the Delegated Powers Memorandum in relation to the Prescription Scotland Bill. And item seven is consideration of the evidence uh, which we're about to hear from the Minister and his officials. Does the committee agree to take these items in private? Okay. <coughs> So we'll move on to agenda item two, which is consideration of the UK withdrawal uh, from the European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill. Our role in scrutinising this bill is to consider the delegated powers in the bill. Uh, so as I've said before, we have uh, before us uh, Michael Russell. Uh, welcome, Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, he's supported by Gerald Byrne, Team Leader, Constitution and UK Relations Division. Graham Fisher, head of branch one. Is there a branch two? Yes, there is, <laughs> right? Okay. Wow. Uh, Constitutional and Civil Law Division. And Luke McBratney, Policy Officer, uh, Constitution and UK Relations Division. Uh, so we'll open the evidence session and uh, invite members to ask questions. And Alison Harris. We'll go first. Thank you. Good morning, Minister. Good morning. You know, my concerns about this bill really boil down to the lack of scrutiny that you know this committee and other committees are actually able to apply. And I'm sure you would appreciate and agree with me that you know a three-week timetable just does not allow for proper scrutiny. And scrutiny is, is what is required by committees to allow Parliament to just basically correctly and properly function. So ultimately, that is actually being denied to Parliament with, with this bill. So what I'm really asking you is, is there any way that, well, firstly, what you have to say about that, and secondly, is there really any way that we could have more time with this bill? Well, I, I would respectfully uh, disagree uh, in terms of scrutiny. It is not the ideal situation for this piece of legislation. But this piece of legislation relies very heavily on the UK bill. There are some differences, but there, uh, there, there's a great deal of similarity too, and no doubt we'll come on to that. I hope we've improved the UK bill in the way that the committee actually sought in terms of uh, the evidence I gave last October and your very helpful report on the UK bill. So the, the, the concepts and some of the detail of the bill should be familiar to members of this committee and members of the parliament. Um, and I would also say that you know, it is not of our making that we are in this position. We have endeavoured and continue to endeavour to reach an agreement with the UK government on the issues uh, outstanding on the UK bill. But that's not yet proved possible, and therefore it is sensible for ourselves and the Welsh Government, and the two of us have been working in lockstep on this, to put in place a, a, a backstop provision in case we don't get that agreement. If we get that agreement, this bill, Clause 37 of this bill, for example, allows us, even if the bill is passed, uh, to suspend the whole or, 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 or to remove the whole or, or parts of the bill. So uh, if the UK Government is inclined to uh, be reasonable, uh, to respect the devolved settlement, then uh, we will not be in a position where this bill will continue. If we aren't in that position, then we will give the bill uh, every opportunity to be scrutinised. And indeed, looking at my diary over the next three weeks, uh, you know, it seems that the, the committees of the Parliament will be doing little but scrutinise this bill, and I welcome that, as will the Chamber. And that will be very useful and important activity. So perhaps instead of simply talking about the lack of scrutiny, it would be useful we got down and scrutinised it. Well, thank you for your response. You know, and whilst I hear everything you're saying, the UK bill that I think you're referring to, uh, this committee has been scrutinising that bill for quite some considerable time, a lot longer than three weeks. So, you know, I, I respectfully disagree with you. My question is nothing to do with politics and everything to do with this committee and scrutiny. 
and I don't see how you can fail to disagree with my view and others' view that three weeks is just simply not long enough to scrutinise something of this importance and magnitude. Well, with the greatest respect, you've just said that this committee has been scrutinising the UK, UK bill for a very considerable period of time. There are very strong similarities. Indeed, there are some identical uh, parts between the two bills. So you have, in that sense, a, a head start by your own admission. But, but I do think that you know, we, we're not in the position we would like to be. Uh, I, I think that to put it bluntly and, and as, as non-politically as I can, I think the UK government bears a responsibility for that. I continue to wish to negotiate. Indeed, when I am not talking about this bill here this week, I will be talking about it in London this week, along with the Welsh and the UK governments. So perhaps we should go on and continue to scrutinise it. I, there is a choice to be made. You may not wish to scrutinise it in those circumstances, but if you do wish to scrutinise it, I am at your disposal. I don't actually... No, sorry, think. sorry. sorry. Yeah, Minister, you don't need to tell us what our job is. We know what our job is. We're here to scrutinise, but members are free to ask whatever they wish. So please don't tell us what our job is. Mrs Harris, do you have anything else? <coughs> well, I, to be perfectly frank, I really think that you launched into a speech, quite frankly, and totally ignored what my question was. I need to bring you back to the scrutiny role. Now, while we have been scrutinising the UK bill for quite some time, and yes, there are undoubtedly similarities, facts remain, Minister... In the Scottish Parliament, this bill in three weeks does not allow us in, DP, in this committee or other committees enough time to scrutinise. That's my point, and I don't appreciate the patronising response that you know well, we can compare. I it. disagree with Thank the point. You. I'm not trying to patronise you. I'm disagree with the point. Uh, it's a point that was made by your colleagues last week. Uh, it is not the ideal situation, but it is the situation we are in. It is not in the situation of the Scottish Government's making. It is a situation of the making of the UK Government because it has not yet agreed on clause. Uh, 11. But the Welsh Government is in exactly the same position and we have brought the bills to the Parliament and we are ready to have them scrutinised. And convener, I'm simply making that point. You know, we are ready to have the bills scrutinised. I'm very happy to appear before this committee now and again should that be required and I've made myself absolutely available you know, to all the committees of the Parliament and to the Chamber and the bill and the information is there and we will be also adding to that information in any way we possibly can. So, so I'm trying to be as helpful as I possibly can. I'm not saying you're not being helpful, but what I'm saying is ultimately you're agreeing with me that whilst everything is not of our making, three weeks is not long enough. I am making the point that you, this committee has already and parts of the Parliament have already scrutinised the UK bill, which is very similar. I'm making the point that we are where we are and we need to go ahead with this. I could make a wider point about Brexit, but out of deference to the convener who does not wish me to do so, I will not make it at this time. Well, my question was on scrutiny, to be fair, so thank you, convener. Probably exhausted that one. Mr Finlay, do you have anything? Um, I think any reasonable person would say that, you know, that this level of um, scrutiny over such an important piece of legislation is not the way that things should be done. And I think it would be um, churlish for anyone to suggest that, that, that it is. Um, but there's a fundamental issue that we have to get to the bottom of, and that is to establish whether this whole process has um, substance or whether it is a depressing one fight between two governments for political reasons. Um, so therefore, I've asked twice and, and once in a parliamentary question and once in debate for the 25 areas of dispute to be published. Um, will you publish them, Minister? Uh, uh, with respect, three governments because the Welsh Government is in the same position. Um, I raised this again with my colleague, Mark Drakeford, last night. It is my wish to publish them. I will raise it tomorrow at the uh, committee, and I hope that all three parties will agree to publish them, and that's what I want to do. I can't publish them ex cathedra, but it is my wish and intention to publish them, and I want to publish them. So you're aware, although I would make one point, Mr Finlay, about them, which I think is quite crucial. This is not only about the 25 items that are left, it is about the principle that underpins those 25 items, and this has been referred to by the Welsh Government as well as by ourselves, which is the principle of a, a imposition of a action rather than agreement to action. So the 25 items are of great importance on their own, but the principle is also of great importance. But I wish to publish them. I, I think the Welsh Government wishes to publish them now. We would want to get them published, and I will do my best. Stopping us from publishing them? I, I don't believe I can publish them without the agreement of all three parties. That might make the negotiating system uh, situation worse, but I will be requesting that. I want to do it, uh, and I would hope to be able to do it as soon as possible after 
uh, Thursday and certainly before stage two. So you're fully aware of that. So the Welsh Government have agreed that they want to see them published? I, I believe that's the case, yes, that they wish to see them published. Could you, after this session, go and lift a phone to your UK counterpart and say, would you agree to publish and we could have them published there, this afternoon? Uh, there, there is already discussion amongst civil servants taking place. It, there is an agreement. It will be my civil servants have asked for it to be raised on Thursday and it will be raised on Thursday. Given that is the meeting at which it has to be raised formally. But I mean, I am willing to do so, and I can't give you more than that, but to say I'm willing to do so. But if you had agreement between the three ministers, um, respect, representing the respective governments, you could publish this afternoon. Well, I don't think we could, because I don't think we agreed the nature of publication, how we're going to publish it, but I want to publish it. I made that commitment to you last week. I've now raised it with the Welsh Government. I want to get it done, and I would like to do it. I hope you would agree that this is absolutely fundamental and people understanding whether this we are going down a route for for perfectly legitimate purposes or whether we're being uh, led in a, uh, for political reasons. Well, I believe you know the, the identity of purpose between ourselves and the Welsh Government would indicate that this is at least something that's shared between the Labour Party in Wales and ourselves as, as an SNP government. Yeah. I don't but believe. I don't can believe. I stop it's, you, can I stop you for I a don't believe it's to do with uh, it with politics, as you've indicated. It's to do with substance. Minister, I hope you will agree that not everything we do is for a, for a narrow party political mm -hmm. reason. We have a role as parliamentarians. Mm -hmm. um, I wish more people would understand that we have a role as parliamentarians to scrutinise this irrespective of our party position. And that's the reason why I think this Absolutely. should be published. So and, and I agree they whatever should be the political makeup of each government, I, for me at this point, is, I agree is they should irrelevant, be irrelevant. So the quicker, the better. I wonder if I could um, ask Mr uh, uh, Fisher, I think it is. Uh, uh, are you the lawyer for the...? Yeah. Um, I wonder if you could tell me um, the legal reason as to why we have to go through the emergency process. Well, it, it, there is a, a legal reason, uh, as well as other reasons, why uh, why the it, it would be significant if the UK bill was enacted before the the continuity bill, um, and part of the reason is because the UK bill would amend the devolution settlement and would prevent the, the Scottish Parliament from then changing the EU withdrawal bill. Sorry. Yeah. Would that only happen on Brexit Day? No. The, if the, the UK bill would amend the devolution settlement before Brexit Day. And is that the, that's the clause 11 element of it, is it? it it's not directly. There's a, there's a technical reason as well as clause 11 itself. Which is? It, it's, it's buried in the detail of Schedule 3 to the EU withdrawal bill, but it, it would amend Schedule 4 to the Scotland Act. So that's the first we've heard that. Well, I mean, it's, it's, that's part and parcel of the restrictions which the, the UK bill would put in put into the into the devolution settlement. Uh, so I, I think, think that's, that's... Well, could I therefore make a request to the Minister that... <laughs> you publish the reason, the legal reason, as to why this is a necessity so that we can test that legal argument. Because that's the first that I have heard the legal argument. I've heard political argument, and I understand the political argument, but we've never heard the legal reason as to why you have to get to the finishing line before the other side, if you like. So it would be good to... Could, I, could I just make a point? Um, as I understand it, the... Uh, that legal argument, which I understand, is now on the record of this committee. I'm happy to see that fleshed out, um, and I'll endeavour to write to the member with fleshing that out so he understands that that is the legal reason. I wonder then, um, could you write to me as the convener? Of course, absolutely happy to do so. Pass it on. Convener, could I, could I say, I think that should go to all members? Well, it it's will be open. It's not just relevant to this committee. I think it should be, I think this is of such importance that it would be very helpful to Parliament to write to all members clarifying here are the legal reasons and fleshing out that so that it is perfectly understood because this is these are complex matters that I think people have the right to um, to have the information at their fingers. Hey, Mr Finley, you're yeah. right to raise it. When I receive the letter, um, I will make 
all members aware of that letter. I think it's um, important as well just to put on the record that as well as these principled or legal reasons for wanting to see the timetable that the Scottish Government has proposed, there's also a very real practical issues for wanting that timetable. Both the requirement to enable changes to be made to the EU withdrawal bill if necessary, but also, and possibly most pressing of all, because the government will need to, on any scenario, whether we're relying on the EU withdrawal bill or the continuity bill or some combination of both, the government will have to start the work, the practical work of preparing for EU withdrawal soon. The UK government is also um, wanting its bill passed by May so that that practical necessary preparation can take place shortly after that. We couldn't um, commit this parliament to any timetable which involved less time for preparation than the UK parliament was getting. Anything else, Mr Finlay, at this no, point? No, that's, uh, that's fine. OK. Um, just a, a point from me before we get into the substantive scrutiny of the bill. Um, how, how close are you, do you think, to actually getting agreement with the UK government on this? Well, I, I, I made it clear, convener, uh, at the weekend that I felt agreement was contingent upon a very simple change that the UK government needed to make, which is in respecting the principles of devolution to uh, uh, make sure that the Scottish Parliament agreed to both the, 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 the subjects that were in any frameworks and the governance of those frameworks. Presently, there, there is no mechanism being discussed for agreement. So if we move to agreement, then agreement will be found. If we don't, then I think it's difficult to do so. Mm. I, I mean, are you confident <coughs> that that agreement can be reached? No, I'm neither. I, I don't have confidence either way. The discussions are continuing. These have been going on since last July. Um, they've been detailed. We've made progress on a whole range of issues, we, you know, and we're glad about that. But we haven't made progress on that issue. There is a meeting of the JMCEN on Thursday, and okay. there is a meeting of the JMC plenary on Wednesday, next Wednesday. Those are both opportunities for agreement to be reached. Um, so far, there is no agreement, and there is nothing that I have seen that shows that the UK government is moving. On the other hand, we are still talking, and that is always positive. Yeah, that's good. So potentially by next week you could have an agreement and this bill that we're here to discuss could be dropped. Yes, and uh, we've, we've made it clear that we will come to the Chamber in those circumstances, report on the agreement, and the Chamber will have the opportunity to say what should happen. But uh, you know, we, we are doing this, as I'm indicating, because we need a backstop in place. There can't be a cliff edge. And we cannot agree to the process, the, some of the detail that the UK government is putting forward. Okay. Right. Yes, uh, Mr. Just, McMillan. Just a, a very uh, brief supplementary. Just uh, on the back of the publication uh, of this bill uh, last week, uh, has there been a, a, an increasing uh, number uh, of uh, discussions between your civil servants and the UK civil servants? I don't think you'd call it increasing. There's pretty constant discussion okay. in any case. There has been for many weeks. There has been, for example, a, a, what was called a deep dive process, uh, which is a, a process which has been going on looking at deep subjects and working out how those subjects might be subject to frameworks or to other actions. Um, and so that process has been going on for a considerable period of time. That was instituted as a result of progress made last year uh, between, really between the October meeting of the JMC and the December meeting of the JMC, <coughs> and then instituted and picked up during that period of time. Okay. okay. That's fine. fine. Okay. Okay, Minister, um, we've got a, a, a series of pre-prepared questions. Uh, some of them are quite technical, so members may just actually read them out. Um, so I'm going to start... Um, Looking at section seven of the bill, which is challenges to the validity of retained or devolved EU law, uh, paragraphs 20 to 25 of the DPM. Section seven, one of the bill prevents a challenge to retained EU law after exit day on the ground that the EU instrument was, quote, invalid before that date. Section 72B and four of the bill allow ministers to make regulations to disapply that rule for particular situations. So can you explain what sort of situations uh, might need to be dealt with by such regulations? 
Uh, I can, uh, but I think I would like Luke McBrackney to uh, start to deal with some of the legal detail. You will understand that we are going to share this task on the legal detail, and we'll all chip in as we can to help the committee, if that is acceptable. Perhaps Luke would like to, to do so. At present, the situation is that domestic courts have no power to uh, disapply an EU instrument on the grounds of validity. Only the Court of Justice can. It will clearly be necessary in situations where the validity or otherwise of an instrument might prejudice an individual's rights or, or interests in some way to be able to provide for that after withdrawal. I would imagine that the situations that we are um, considering disapplying the rule in Section 7 in would be broadly similar to the situations that currently exist it for, as respects uh, the Court of Justice's power to disapply instruments as invalid. Um, our intention would be to coordinate our use of the power with the UK government's parallel and corresponding power in paragraph one of schedule one of the EU withdrawal bill. Um, I would be happy to write to the committee uh, very urgently in the next day or two with more detail about that particular possible use of the power. Uh, that, that would be useful. Um, given that we've got stage one debate tomorrow, you might want to uh, do uh, that later today. I shall write to the committee later today. Thank you. Um, so introducing a right of challenge in the way that Section 7 does could create significant outcomes in the courts. Has any consideration been given to the regulations being subject to an enhanced affirmative procedure to allow the Parliament an opportunity to review the regulations before they're formally laid for scrutiny? Um, on all of these issues, um, we are happy to consider that as a positive step forward, should that be helpful. I mean, we, you know, I'm not going to go to the wall for any of the, the issues in terms of affirmative or enhanced affirmative procedure. Mm. I, I think you know, we, we, we've made it clear, for example, in the um, uh, where we find ourselves on the issues that the committee raised the last time with me, <coughs> that in almost all of them, we've made the changes that the committee suggested. Mm. You know, um, it, the UK bill was defective, and we've actually made those positive changes. So I make that general commitment. Yeah. Um, the, 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 the conditions for enhanced affirmative uh, procedure are laid out in the bill very clearly. Um, it, and you know, if there is a suggestion that we add to those conditions, then I think that that's something that we would look at very, very carefully indeed. I think we would require to do it in that way rather than on a case-by-case -case basis, because I think we do need to have a template against which to judge which would be enhanced affirmative, which would be affirmative, and therefore what is left mm -hmm. to, to be negative. But if there was you know, a case to be made for adding to those criteria, the three criteria we already have, then we'd be happy to look at it. But I think we'd look for a suggestion about what that criteria would be. Okay, that's very useful. Uh, Mrs Harris, I think you've got the next question. Yes, section 11 of the bill contains a wide power on the, on the Scottish ministers to correct failures of the retained devolved EU law to operate eff effectively and also to correct deficiencies in the law. The committee has already considered evidence in connection with similar powers in the European withdrawal bill. In its report on that bill, the committee concluded, and I'll quote, the power should only be available where ministers can show that it is necessary to make a change to the statute book even if they cannot show that the particular alternative chosen is itself necessary. So it would appear that the same principle is applying for this bill, but what reassurance, Minister, can you give this committee that the powers in Section 11 can only be used to make changes which are no more than necessary to make the law work efficiently? on exit? Well, we have done exactly what the committee has suggested, and you know, we found ourselves that the UK bill, we thought, was uh, a, a defective in this regard, so we have changed this to a test of necessity, uh, and that is what ex now exists in the, um, the legislation. That test of necessity is a, is a pretty strong test for any minister uh, to, to meet, uh, and you know, we quite clearly believe that that is the right thing to have done. Uh, once that test of necessity has been met, then it does become a choice of appropriate policy solutions. But the test of necessity, you made the point, we thought it was correct, and we've put it within the bill. So, Just before you move on, right. um, we did make that point, but when we took evidence on this, um, we also made the point that even if you apply the test of necessity, that in itself is a judgment call. Mm -hmm. um, so you could regard something as necessary and I wouldn't. Hmm. 
the bill sets out the conditions for the ministers minister to be satisfied of the test of necessity. So the minister has to be satisfied that it is necessary for a particular purpose set out in the bill, and that is to make provision for the purpose of preventing, remedying or mitigating a failure or other deficiency under section 11. So it's, it is, it's a textured test rather than just an exercise of pure judgment by the minister. And somebody pointed out to me yesterday in considering this paragraph that the words preventing and failure are strong words in legislation, as you will know as a committee. So that test is pretty severe for the minister to meet. So whilst I think, of course, there will be and inevitably will be a judgment, the, the nature of that judgment is contextualised by the legislation itself. Yes. Okay, well, I was just going to go on to ask, you know, how can you explain about a failure in the operation of retained devolved EU law? You know, how is that going to be identified as necessary? Well, I mean, the legislation therefore defines prevention and, and, and has the word failure within it. I think the, the real issue you need to examine here is the ways in which European law presently apply and how it should apply. <coughs> For example, there are... If you look at agricultural matters and agricultural mm -hmm. support, there are structures you know, that are clearly required to be changed because they can't operate. But then within the regulations for those structures, there may be things that those structures are meant to do, which they cannot do because they don't exist and which no longer is the situation. In all those cir circumstances, that is the type of thing that this is designed to, to meet. And, and we would look at the way in which things operate. These are exceptional circumstances. I, I don't have to remind you of this. Mm. These are circumstances I don't mm -hmm. think we'll ever see again. So as we look at these, we will have to be able to say, how would we have a working and functioning system after the, the, the day itself? Uh, and if it's not going to be a working of functioning system, if it is going to fail because the legislation is not there, then that's a circumstance in which we have to, to move. Now, sometimes to move rapidly, but to move with greater scrutiny than was previously the case under the UK bill. OK, well, if we start to look at Section 11.3b to be more specific, can you explain the purpose of the power in Section 11.3b to allow ministers to further describe the deficiencies in retained devolved EU law? You know, that power is not really limited by being necessary in the view of the Scottish ministers. So why would that be? Um, the new power in Section 11.3b reflects a concession made by the UK government during the Commons in the EU Withdrawal Bill, which is that the list of types of deficiencies in Section 11, subsection 2, which used to be non-exhaustive, that is, it was only indicative of the sort of things that might have been deficiencies, is now exhaustive. So if something does not fall within the classes of deficiency enumerated in Section 11, subsection 2, it's not a deficiency. However, the entire basis of the exercise that we are conducting, both us and the UK government, the Welsh government, the uh, uh, civil servants in Northern Ireland, is predicated on a substantial amount of uncertainty about exactly what a deficiency might involve. Mm. So when the UK government made that concession, it took this power, so that if, during that exercise, um, it becomes clear that there is something which requires to be addressed in retained EU law, something that will stop functioning, that needs to be added to that list, it can be. It is, in that sense, a sort of reserve or backstop power. It, because it involves, because the use of that power would involve um, the effective supplementing of primary legislation, it would involve expanding an existing mm. provision to make delegated legislation, we consider it appropriate that it should be subject to the affirmative procedure. Okay, thank, thank you. Perhaps thank I could just stress, Camina, the three steps that we've taken to address the issues that are raised to us, first of all. First of all, we have applied a test of necessity, which is obviously extremely important. Secondly, we've put in additional limits on the powers that we think are appropriate. And thirdly, there's an enhanced role for the Scottish Parliament in the regulations. I think those are all important steps, which again contextualise what we're trying to do uh, and make sure that there is an improvement on the situation that existed. Okay. Okay, uh, Mr. Finlay. Yeah, um, Section 13, uh, power to make provision correspond to EU law after exit day. Um, 
this is quite, um, a, in fact, this is a very significant uh, power. The Delegated Powers uh, Memorandum describes the power as giving ministers the ability to ensure that, where appropriate, devolved law in Scotland keeps pace with post-withdrawal developments in the EU. Why is um, such a power necessary in a, a bill uh, that deals with the continuity of powers uh, upon the withdrawal of the UK from the EU? Well, I, I think we have to go back to, to what the expectations of the UK bill were. And there were expectations that the UK bill would uh, contain this so that there were circumstances in which uh, any administration could say, for example, in environmental regulation, we want to make sure this continues to match environmental regulation because we don't want this to weaken in any way or because it's important to us, for example, in food safety, that we don't want to risk exporting or, or, or sales. When the bill, we first saw the bill, we were, I think, very surprised that this was not part of the bill. Uh, and we did believe that that was an ideological decision to prevent um, this taking place. We felt uh, <coughs> from the beginning that this should be available as an option um, and as an option to ministers with parliamentary scrutiny and parliamentary <coughs> approval uh, and also as a sunsetted option. And this is, this is what's in here. And this power, and we've introduced this, as the Welsh Bill has introduced this, in order to allow ministers the flexibility so to do in areas of importance. You know, the environmental charities, for example, have been very strong in saying that they want to see a continuation and a keeping pace, and they're worried about it in areas such as um, a, a human rights, for example. There's a fear of falling behind, and of course that's been part of the declaration that the, the third sector signed some weeks ago. So we're, fine, we're giving the opportunity for this to take place in this um, section. Now, it, it can't... Um, it is scrutinised. The, the section puts scrutiny, strongly scrutiny within us. It doesn't keep us in the EU, which is one of the arguments that was used against us when the bill was originally, UK bill was a, uh, originally published. It's being taken for practical reasons that are helpful to a variety of sectors. It will be up to ministers to bring forward um, their proposals. It will be up to Parliament to accept or otherwise those proposals. But why does it need to be in this bill? Because I don't know anywhere else that we could put it. Why Where else could we put it? Could it not come back in a separate piece of legislation so that we have, you know, full, <laughs> full scrutiny over this? Well, we this is a very wide-ranging power. Well, it, it's a power that's subject to to scrutiny. It is a power that is clear. It is a power that many people have called for. It is a power that will be useful to a vast range of organisations which want to see these things take place. This is an appropriate place for it to be there. We had expected it to be there and it wasn't in the UK bill. We are remedying that defect as we, for example, in the Charter of Fundamental Rights, are remedying what we think is a, a mistake by the UK. That's why it's in here. But it gives, you would concede that it gives very, very significant powers to ministers to bring in um, law through delegated powers which doesn't have the level of scrutiny that other pieces of legislation have? No, I, I, I wouldn't concede that with respect. What I would say is it allows the continuation of the present situation in key areas, which is what many people wish to see, and we think that this is um, a, a useful thing to do. Uh, if the committee thinks it's too broad, obviously it will wish to say so. If it wishes to see greater scrutiny of this process, then I'm sure it will wish to say so, and we would certainly consider that. Mr Finlay, what, do, you, do you list these key areas anywhere? No, but they would, any of the areas in which we presently operate under EU law would be uh, a, a covered by it. So any, well, all it, areas of EU law? Well, the areas of EU law in which we are involved. Prime, and there are a number of those. Clearly, we couldn't do so in areas where we change the structures. For example, you couldn't do so in agricultural support if there was no equivalent mechanism. But you could do so in environmental protection, for example, on this, the, the Habitats Directive. Before I ask anything, do you carry on? No, it's fine. Do, do you, you got another point to make on that before I continue? I just want, I just want clarity, because there'll, there'll be pe people watching this session. Um, and are, are you saying, essentially, that after, after we leave the EU, you, you would want Scotland to um, basically take on board EU laws after, after that as they change? 
if there were areas in which that was deemed to be appropriate, for example, in food standards, 98% of our food standards legislation comes from the EU. Many people believe it would be appropriate to continue to keep pace with changes in the European law in that area. That would be a thing that ministers could bring to the Scottish Parliament uh, and say we would like to do so. Um, it would be to the Scottish Parliament to say yea or nay. And we also believe, because it is a power uh, that needs to be kept under review, that it should be time limited and the, committee, the Parliament should be able to scrutinise that. And what level of scrutiny would Parliament get? Let, you know, well, let's say, let, you know, you, you see a piece of EU law that you quite like the look of. Um, you think, well, bring that to Parliament. What level of scrutiny do we <coughs> say yes or no? It would be within the context of the existing legal structure, to update that existing legal structure. Um, the, what we're proposing at the moment is to have um, this uh, subject to the same level of scrutiny as the fixing powers, and that could be affirmative, uh, super affirmative, enhanced regulatory um, means of scrutinising it. Uh, obviously, if the committee wishes to see greater scrutiny or has concerns, it would want to say so. But, I mean, things like EU law and food safety, uh, in many people's views, should be continued because it is vitally important, for example, to our process of exporting. Okay. Mr Finlay? Yeah, the um, 13 a um, is about extending the period in which 13-1 uh, regulation may be made, uh, and that is to last for five years after exit day, but there is provision for that to extend even further. Um, within 13.8. Could you comment on that? One moment. Sorry, Mr Finney, your point was? So, uh, the powers in 13.1 yes. last for five years after yes. the exit day in accordance with 13.7 of the bill. Section 13.8 mm -hmm. allows ministers to make regulations which extend that five-year period further. Yes. Is this just an open further... Uh, by a period of up to five years and extend any period of extension under subsection by a further period of five years. So it is a five-yearly cycle. <coughs> so does that mean by ten years? I mean, it's five years followed by another five years, followed by another five years if the Parliament so says. Or no, f no, no extension because the Parliament says no. So... Um, Plain a role as, as a parliamentarian, not a party role, given that I voted uh, remain. Um, someone could be reading that section and say, so they want powers to implement EU law that they, they like for five years, but that can continue for as long as they, they want. So, ineffectively, um, you, you can understand why some people would possibly look at this and say, this is just looking to frustrate the whole process. No, I, I can understand that, but that's not what is in the bill. What the bill is saying is there may be areas in which this is useful and, and in fact, extremely important. And in those circumstances, ministers can make a recommendation on that. And if that happens, then that is reviewed every five years and it will cease to happen after five years if that is the view of Parliament or it will continue to happen for another five years. Now, five years isn't arbitrary. It seems to be a reasonable length of time. But, for example, the bill would be capable of amending for that to three years or seven years. Uh, it would depend what members wanted to do. So uh, you could actually reword that and say that it's, uh, um, you have the powers for however long subject to Parliament ending those powers? No, there is a cut-off point, and they would require to be a renewal, which presumably would be subject to intensive parliamentary scrutiny, as this power has been. Um, but the question is, how long should that period be? OK. It's fine. OK. Stuart. Thank you. Um, Minister, um, Section 14 specifies that regulations under Sections 11, 12 and 13 containing provisions of the sort which are listed in section 14.2 must be subject to the affirmative procedure. And how did you uh, come to this um, way, this uh, decision that uh, only those matters in section 14.2 should be subject to the affirmative procedure? Well, as I indicated earlier to the convener, uh, we, we applied a set of criteria. Now, it is a question of whether those criteria are adequate or wish to be added to, I suppose, that is germane here. 
Um, the enhanced procedure is, is used in, uh, and we are recommending is used in, a, in a, 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 when an instrument establishes a new Scottish public authority, gives a function to a new Scottish public authority, or removes a current EU function without replacing it. So those are clear and very serious issues. You know, and I think we would all accept those are first level issues. The affirmative procedure would then apply if uh, we give a current EU function to an existing Scottish public authority. Uh, if we impose a, or a fee or a charge for carrying out a function, to create or widen the scope of a criminal offence, or to create or amend power to legislate. So that's the second level. If neither, neither of those sets of tests apply, then everything else in powers is subject to the negative procedure. So those are the criteria we've applied. They're laid out clearly. But the question, I suppose, is, and, and, and absolutely open for debate, uh, whether those lists should be changed or enhanced in any way. Well, certainly, the section 14.5 uh, has the effect of making the regulations containing particular provisions subject to the, the enhanced affirmative provision. And can, can you, Minister, explain the reasons for that particular uh, type of uh, regulation being subject to the enhanced affirmative procedure? And also, certainly, in your comments earlier uh, regarding the affirmative and enhanced provisions were actually very helpful, but the Delegated Powers Memorandum uh, paragraph 41 says that the, any regulations uh, providing for, uh, for any function of an EU entity uh, to be exercised by an existing uh, Scottish public authority are subject to the affirmative procedure. Can you explain how that is achieved under section 14.2 of the Bill? Yes, I can by reference again to, to what I've just said. Okay. Um, the issue of the public authorities, I think, is the case, is, is what you're raising. And the enhanced procedure applies to new authorities and f functions uh, given to new authorities. <coughs> the, <coughs> apologies, the affirmative procedure gives current functions to existing authorities, right, um, and also deals with other matters. So those are the distinctions we're applying in terms of the public authorities. Uh, one level is in terms of new authorities and new functions. Uh, the other one is in terms of existing authorities and existing functions. But, you know, those are, those are absolutely subject to, to discussion and debate, and it may well be that other views would apply. Uh, we've also, of course, with the 60-day period, uh, extended the period from the 40 days that is you know, normally in this, these circumstances. So that gives a higher level of scrutiny as well. And uh, certainly the government's uh, delegated powers memorandum points to uh, the choice of procedures for the various powers in sections 11, 12 and 13. And how do you, Minister, envisage that that choice actually being decided? And why is there no role for Parliament in considering if the appropriate level of scrutiny has been chosen? Well, there is a, a definition of the necessity, as we know. So once we move from necessity in terms of appropriate level, then the appropriate level is defined in the circumstances in which I've given. So there's a context for all those decisions. I mean, none of these decisions are being made without a context being given for them in the bill. And certainly the effect of section 14.7 and 8 of the bill is that uh, there's been a kind of choice by ministers to actually comply with the, the enhanced procedure. Uh, and that doesn't prevent regulations being laid before the Parliament and also approved. Uh, why is it appropriate for the Bill uh, to include provision that ministers may proceed uh, to lay regulations that do not comply with the procedures as approved uh, by the Parliament? Do you want to? These, are, these provisions are the equivalents of the provisions that apply for the affirmative procedure generally and any failures by the Scottish ministers when laying an instrument to meet the ambitions of the affirmative procedure. In that situation, the obligation on Scottish ministers is the right to presiding officer with an explanation, and these provisions simply echo that for the additional requirements imposed under enhanced affirmative procedure. The, we, we, we would never intend to lay an instrument without the ambition to meet the procedural requirements of the enhanced affirmative procedure. Could I just make an additional point, which is the point that this committee asked for instruments to be accompanied by explanatory statements. Now, the EU withdrawal bill in the UK has been amended in such a way, and the continuity bill provides for those in the Scottish Parliament. Those statements, uh, just to be clear what they would do, and again, I think this adds the belt and braces explanation, the Scottish the, the state, statement would include 
fact that the Scottish ministers don't consider it to be uh, to be no more than appropriate. In other words, it is isn't any more than is is appropriate. Whether it modifies any provision of equalities legislation, if so, what that effect is. That the Scottish ministers have had regard to their duties under equalities legislation. There is a report on any consultation, and there is an explanation of the instrument, the reasons for making it, the pre-withdrawal law being modified by it, and its effect on retained EU law. So that's a pretty comprehensive set uh, of pieces of information that would would apply and would be given. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we'll move on now to section 19 of the bill, which is the power to provide for fees and charges. Uh, you'll recall that in our report on the European Union Withdrawal Bill, uh, we expressed concern about the capacity of ministers to impose taxation measures in regulations under Schedule 4 of that bill. Um, we also raised concern about the potential for sub-delegation and the scrutiny procedure attached to regulations under Schedule 4 of the Bill. Uh, now, these concerns uh, appear not to have been responded to in Section 19 of this Bill. Uh, so can you explain why you've retained the approach um, taken in the EU Withdrawal Bill? Well, I think, I think we're happy to, to listen to this on, on, uh, again. I think the view that we've taken up until now, the consistent view we've taken, is that the affirmative procedure is appropriate when there is a new fee. In fact, the super affirmative procedure is necessary when there is a new fee or, fun or, or, or charge. But thereafter, that is simply repetition. So in terms of the, 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 the scrutiny of this, we accept absolutely that the first time that this is applied, there should be such scrutiny. But we don't see it as necessary thereafter. On the other matters, I have to say that we are very open to having this discussion and to seeing whether there's more what we can do. I mean, we, we think what is in here is appropriate, but um, you know, it may well be that the committee still wishes to see further action taken, in which case we'll very much listen to that. Uh, you know, fees and charges seem a bit abstract, but there are, for example, in the European Union, and depending on what, and this is all dependent on what trade agreements are reached, there could be a wide-ranging system of fees and charges. Um, you know, presently, salmonella testing attacks fees and charges. But there could be fees and charges for shellfish exportation. You know, that is a real live situation. Uh, consignments of live animals from third countries at border inspection posts may apply uh, more uh, fees and charges. So there's a range of things in here, and if these are to be applicable, then there will be a reasonable burden of new uh, regulation, which will require at the first stage to be scrutinised. I think thereafter we would expect it to be um, more likely simply to be applied. At, at present, the scrutiny arrangement for these fees and charges powers echoes both the arrangement in the UK bill, which this committee made recommendations about, yeah and the arrangements for existing powers under the European Communities Act and the Finance Act. As the Minister has said, it's something that we're, we, will, we will reflect on before stages one, two and three. Okay. Uh, well, st stage one is tomorrow. <laughs> uh, so we may want to be looking at it for stage two, which is next week. Um, would that be a, a matter of uh, this committee coming up with a suggestion? Uh, it, we're very open to that suggestion, um, you know, and happy to discuss it. And I mean, uh, with urgency, of course. I mean, yes. I do accept. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, with the greatest respect, I'm also aware of the timetable that is pressing upon us. So, in those circumstances, of course. Right. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask about uh, exit day now, which is uh, section 28. Um, the bill allows Scottish ministers to set an exit day by regulations. Um, that day is relevant for a number of other provisions in the bill. Um, it doesn't provide any limits on the date that can be fixed. Now, surely exit day, wherever you come from politically, exit day is the day that the UK leaves the EU. Why don't we just say that in the bill? Well, this has, this has caused huge debate at Westminster, as you know, convener. And the first phase of that debate was everybody saying, let's just put this date on the face of the bill. So eventually, the date was put on the face of the bill. Now there's a huge wave saying, but hang on a minute, 
that date might have to change. There might be circumstances in which it needs to change. So we've taken the agnostic position on this. You know, there is no possibility in this bill that it does anything other than mirrors what the exit date is as set by the UK government. I mean, there's, there's no other function for this. It can't be used for any, any other function. Um, and you know, we would accept that unless something very dramatic happens, and you know, many of us are eye hoping, but uh, unless the, uh, something very dramatic happens, the UK will leave the EU at 11 p.m. on 29th of March 2019. But you know, it, it is not yet set and absolutely cast in stone. And until it is, that is done, it would seem sensible just to have the ability to put this in at a later time. You know, I mean, I, I honestly wouldn't, again, go to the wall for it. But given the debate has raged backwards and forwards at Westminster, sometimes it's quite wise just to watch other people holding the jackets and to say, well, <laughs> you know, we'll just wait and see what happens here rather than get involved in this debate. But it's a matter of... It's a matter of fact that ex exit day is the day the UK leaves. So, uh, I mean, let, let me just read the wording of the bill. It, in this act, exit day means such day as the Scottish ministers may, by regulations, appoint. The power under subsection 1 to appoint a day includes a power to appoint a time on that day, where the Scottish ministers appoint a time as well as a day, uh, as exit day, uh, and then it goes on from that. So basically it's giving Scottish ministers the power to decide when exit day is. And, uh, but that, you know, factually, exit day and time is when the UK leaves. It's not it, a matter it, for you to... It, it, it why don't we just say in the bill that exit day is the same as when the UK leaves? I'm happy to consider that as, a, as an amendment that we can look at bringing. But there's no okay. intention, there was no intention of this, in this of doing anything other than saying, this is a decision for the UK, we're not getting involved in this decision, and we're not deciding on it differently ourselves. It's a rather bizarre way to say that, then. I, I don't think it's bizarre at all. I think it is the way in which it has been said. If there's another way to say it, look, again, I'm not going to the wall for it. Right, so that could be another amendment for next week. Could be. Right, so we'll just clear that up, shall we, in the, in the bill. There, there Good. will need, in any scenario, to be an ability to, to, to alter the date of exit day and how that applies under the regime. The, uh, uh, the UK and European Council, under Article 50, can adjust the time and date of exit day, so we need to be able, at least in principle, to contemplate that happening. Ms Finlay? Just, I mean, just so, no, no, no. My understanding that the premise behind the bill was to try and create some certainty. Yeah? Certainty and continuity. Yeah. A, a phrase like that, a, a, a clause like that, and it does not create certainty. In fact, it does the complete opposite. Well, it, 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 it is absolutely clear, you know, and, and I've said it, I said it in response to a question from you last week. I'm saying it again here. The, the exit day will be the day on which the UK leaves, if it leaves, uh, and that is likely to be 11 p.m. on the 29th of March 2019. So that the minister moves, brings an amendment ASAP on that, and just that will resolve this, and it will save. I've agreed to that. So I will take either. this away and, and look for a suitable amendment. Good. Okay. Right, Stuart McMillan. Thank you. It's uh, section 31, uh, Minister, regarding the scrutiny of regulations in urgent cases. Um, the section provides that uh, the urgent procedure is to be used in, in limited circumstances of the powers listed in subsection 1. Uh, can, uh, can you, Minister, explain uh, when those powers might be used and how a decision uh, to use the urgent procedure might actually be reached? Well, it is, it is something that is required and is required in much legislation. It's a just-in-case provision. You don't want to find yourself in a circumstance where you can do nothing at all. But, I mean, we have made, you know, I made the commitment before and I make it again here. It could, could and would only be used if absolutely necessary. But given the scale and pace of EU withdrawal, should it become necessary, we would have to use it. But there are safeguards around it. There are things that we need to do in, in all these circumstances. And uh, you know, I suspect we would be roundly criticised for endeavouring to use it, frankly. Um, but I, I think it, it has to be there as a, a backstop again. So, um, so, so this is quite a, a consistent, um, a consistent uh, phraseology that's utilised in. Uh, in most legislation, is that correct? 
Um, this particular formulation is identical to the one in the EU withdrawal bill. In fact, I believe it was a recommendation of the committee that the two governments consider whether an urgent or made affirmative procedure should be available in the Scottish Parliament as well. We have reflected on that and we accept entirely the UK government's reasons for seeking itself to take that urgent procedure. Um, we are unusually in a programme of pretty substantial subordinate legislation up against a very hard and uh, fast deadline, as Mr Finlay points out. It, the 29th of March 2019 is, is coming and, and, and is at, the, at present the date on which the UK will leave the EU in those circumstances. And given the ongoing uncertainty about the scenario in which the UK is going to leave the EU, we, have a, we anticipate that there may be a requirement for urgent uh, for instruments to be made under the urgent procedure. However, the Minister has given the commitment that this, these would only be made in exceptional circumstances. Can I ask Mr Brandon? Sorry, just, just to add to that, you've also seen that the um, Secretary of State for Scotland wrote to the Scottish Government on, particularly in the made affirmative procedure, and whether we wanted that to be extended to Scotland in the UK withdrawal bill, if any agreement is reached on that bill, and the Minister, in his response, which was copied to this committee, did reflect your recommendation um, and our view that, yes, that probably was an idea because of all the circumstances that um, Lucas set out on uh, on the need for speed and flexibility and robustness, which is what we've really been looking for, I think, throughout the provisions in both our bill and then when we look at the UK withdrawal bill. So quite a few of our criticisms of the UK withdrawal bill have been based on the fact that there are gaps in the Scottish minister's powers, unlike those of the UK ministers, and we can see a need for those to be mirrored precisely to allow for the flexibility that we were describing, particularly on um, Clause 17 and our Section 32. So there, there, is a, there is a parallel process going on here between what we've done in this bill and, and improvements we are seeking to the UK bill in the event that we reach agreement on that bill. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, I think you. Section 37, uh, had been, I think the Minister had dealt with that in his uh, earlier comments. I think he dealt with that quite uh, comprehensively. Okay. Yeah, that simply honours the commitment we have made that should we be able to reach agreement even after this bill is passed, section 37 is a sort of um, auto-destruct yeah. button. Yeah. So it's contingent upon reaching an agreement and nothing else? Well, that would be the most likely circumstances in which it would operate. Right. And again, we would have to bring... Uh, you know, I've made, I made a commitment last week, I think, in the chamber that you know, during the process of the bill, uh, you know, we could still withdraw it up until stage one, though that, that happens to be tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty, pretty, pretty sure that's not going to happen. Uh, but thereafter, we will obviously have to bring, if we require to, a motion to the chamber. After that, then there would be regulations which would be subject to affirmative procedure. Okay. Alison Harris. It has heard previously from stakeholders in connection with the European Union Withdrawal Bill about the need for early engagement on consultation drafts of regulations to be made under the Bill. Those concerns obviously apply here as well. So, to address these concerns, can you, Minister, explain what steps the Government will take to ensure early engagement on legislation which might be brought forward under this Bill? And additionally, sorry, just it, well, if you want to, I was going to ask you if there's any scope for more legislation to be brought forward under the affirmative procedure. Um, we are the super affirmative procedure, of course, has a you know, substantial stakeholder consultation in it, and we will make sure that that is observed to the letter. Uh, we would want to make sure at each step on all regulations there was full engagement from uh, stakeholders. Um, you know, they, they, there are vast areas in Scottish life and sectors of Scottish. Uh, business and the economy, where people are very worried indeed about the implications of Brexit. I spend a lot of my time talking to them and trying to understand those concerns and trying to reassure them. As we move into a process where action, legislative action is being taken, uh, I think there will be an element of reassurance just that legislative action is being taken, but we will want to make sure that that action is the right action and it engages properly with the stakeholders in the key areas, and that's exactly what we will do and what we've been doing up until now. Okay, and what about the? Is there scope for more legislation? Did more leg uh, Sorry, in, in what way? Forward, to be brought forward under the affirmative procedure. Um, I, I really am not sure about that at the present moment. I mean, which areas would you think? It's just generally, just. I think. I admit well, there will be a considerable amount of legislation that we've indicated, mm -hmm. you know, throughout this process, um, and, and you know, this. Uh, 
whatever happens, whether we get an agreement with the UK and that bill moves forward, or whether this bill moves forward in parallel with the UK bill, then that really is the start of a major process. Now, some of that is contingent upon the timetable as the UK government sets. If it manages to achieve a transition period, and the acquis continues to apply, then the period during which those changes would be required uh, may be extended. I mean, it depends on the definition of when you leave, to go back to the leaving date, and what happens when you leave and what does apply. But assuming that the acquis continues to apply and the legislation continues to apply, then the period of time for those changes to come through is the period of time of transition. So that was likely to be December 2020, though, though there seems to be some talking that that would be longer. If that is the case, then obviously it gives us a bit more time to bring that volume of legislation through and to have those conversations. Okay, thank you. So just on that point, um, and we've raised it before, we've asked, I, I seem to recall we asked you about this when you were last here, um, about the preparations for the potential volume of statutory instruments? Um. Hmm. Very considerable preparations have taken place across government. Um, there are estimates, and they're only estimates of the numbers, uh, and, and the estimate might be around 300 items, which is the total of a year's SSIs coming through for this uh, alone. Now, clearly, yeah. uh, that's a, a considerable number. Uh, we anticipate were that to be the case that quite clearly we would do it in a methodical and, and careful way it could be of course over that th three-year period let us assume the sake of argument that whatever happens royal assent to these bills takes place at some stage in the late spring so we are then talking from a period of april may say may through until the end of 2020, which would give you uh, 19 and 20 to do it with a half a, an additional half year, so two and a half years for that process, you would have to prioritise them. A great deal of work has been done in government on working out you know, the areas which are con we are concerned with, and we will continue in that way. As far as resourcing it is concerned, the UK government has allocated resources, as you know, uh, for Brexit, and we would expect to be able to draw down a, a share of that to allow us to do so. Okay. Um, do members have any further questions? Yeah, I wonder if I could ask a final um, point. Um, in relation to the, the whole process, I mean, what we're finding is obviously that 40 years of uh, economic and political um, convergence, integration, whatever you want to call it, with the EU is proving hugely problematic to unravel. I wonder if that provides any lessons for others or those like yourself who would seek to unravel 300 years of political, uh, economic and social integration with the rest of the UK? Uh, I'm happy to answer if you wish me to answer. I might rule that one out, Mr Finlay. <laughs> it was a, a little bit mischievous. <laughs> so. I would simply say preparation <laughs> and thoughtfulness, neither of which we have seen from the UK. <laughs> you, never, you never let us down. Okay, um, I think that exhausts our questions. You've agreed to write to us uh, on a couple of matters yeah. and you've helpfully uh, agreed uh, to a couple of amendments. Um, so we'll presumably hear from you on that or we can suggest them. It's up to you. We will endeavour to come back to you on those today. Yes. Um, on the issue of the date, I'm just happy to take that on board and we'll get on with it. Right. On the other issue of amendment, let me consider it in the next half hour or so okay. and we'll come back to you very promptly. Uh, and I'm grateful to the committee for their time. Okay, and thank you. 25, of 25. Um, and I've made a commitment yes. to Mr. Finlay and to the committee, and I will write to you um, uh, when we have the agreement, which I hope to have from the UK government. Okay, Phone thank call you very today. much, and we'll suspend briefly.
Right, we'll move on to uh, agenda item three, consideration of an instrument subject to the affirmative procedure. No points have been raised by our advisors on the Scottish landfill tax standard rate and lower rate order 2018 SSI 2018-87. Uh, Is the committee content with this instrument? Okay. Agenda item four, uh, consideration of instruments subject to negative procedure. The National Health Service General Medical Services Contract Scotland Regulations, uh, SSI uh, 66, 2018. Our legal advisers have identified a number of errors in the instrument relating to ground I, defective drafting, as well as on the general ground, as there are other drafting errors. The following errors have been identified in relation to ground I. Paragraph 33.3e of Schedule 6, which provides for a modification of the, quotes, NHS dispute resolution procedure, the first occurrence of subparagraph E should be head C of the list in preceding subparagraph 19. The second occurrence of subparagraph E should be on a separate line as it intended to be the paragraph 33.3e. The duties of the person nominated to work with the data protection officer in terms of paragraph 72 of Schedule 6 should refer to matters set out under paragraph 67b and c rather than paragraph 67b only. Paragraph 89.3a and b of Schedule 6 are intended to obligate the parties to attempt informal resolution and to bar them from beginning the formal NHS dispute resolution procedure until the less formal local dispute resolution process is attempted. As the Health Board, which is a party to the contract, is defined as, quote, the second Health Board, the references in paragraph 89.3a and b should be to the second Health Board rather than the first Health Board. Paragraph 109.1 of Schedule 6 which relates to the imposition of contract sanctions ought to refer to all heads of paragraph 109.2 and there are missing paragraph references at the end of paragraph 110.5 of Schedule 6 uh, termination of contract by the Health Board which should refer to paragraphs 101 to 107. The other errors identified by advisers in relation to the general reporting ground will be set out in the committee's report. So does the committee wish to draw the regulations to the attention of the Parliament on ground I in respect of defective, defective drafting and on the general ground? Okay. The National Health Service Primary Medical Services Section 17C Agreements, Scotland Regulations 2018 SSI 2018-67 our advisers have identified an error in the instrument relating to ground I, defective drafting, as well as other drafting errors under the general ground. Does the committee wish to draw the regulations to the attention of the Parliament on ground I, as the provision in Schedule 2, paragraph 26.3a, appears to be defective, defectively drafted? A cross-reference to paragraph 28.1 of Schedule 2 is included... But the reference should be to paragraph 26, 1 or 2, and on the general ground, as there are other drafting errors in the instrument. Does the committee wish to welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to lay amending regulations in early course? And we agree to the previous question. Right. Does the committee wish to indicate that the Scottish Government's quality control procedures ought to have avoided the high number of errors which appear in these instruments by the time they were made and lay before the Parliament. Okay. No points have been raised by advisers on SSI 2018 74 to 77. Is the committee content with these instruments? Okay. Agenda item 5, consideration of instruments not subject to any, any parliamentary procedure. No points have been raised by our advisers on uh, SI 2018-187 and SSI 2018-73. Is the committee content with these instruments? I'll now move the meeting into private session.